I'm so new. Preparing. Yes, I got it. We're live. Oh, I just sent you a request to record. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. It's uh, it's really cool to be joining everyone here. I saw there was actually quite a bit of interest in attending this live video, which I'm pretty grateful for because I didn't think of this when we planned this, but this is like the Thursday before the long weekend. So um, I think most people are, you know, doing something fun. And here we are all talking about research. So um, I, I have to admit, I respect everyone's um, interest in best practices that they're willing to give up some of their night to, to join us for the live event. Although this is definitely being recorded. So if you have something more pressing to do than Rachel and I, um, uh, clearly feel free to leave and come back and listen to this again later. We understand. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Rachel and I are going to be doing a, a series of live uh, Facebook podcast events. And um, I'm very excited about that. Dr. Schechter is uh, an, an expert researcher in the field, and we've been doing a ton of collaborations over the last year. Um, and there are more on the horizon, some pretty cool ones that I'm excited about, by the way, not to drop too many Easter eggs. But uh, <laughs> before I, I say anything else, why don't I let uh, you introduce yourself a bit more to everyone, Dr. Schechter? Sure. So I met Nate probably over a year ago. Um, I was like, who's this person posting on the science of reading Facebook pages? I was like, I like what he's saying. Um, it's because I myself, I was really trying to understand the movement and the response to the science of reading. I remember reading Emily Hansford's pieces um, back in 2019 and thinking, wow, she really blowing the lid off this one. And I thought it was great. Um, I've always been really passionate about product research. So, um, and I want to help people understand research. You know, I'm someone who actually did go into college as a math major. And then I felt I was the only girl and I felt like, oh, this isn't for me. But then when I discovered statistics, I was like, no, that, this is the math, the math to solve problems. I like it to explain, to explain what's happening. Right. Um, so. I think that the last thing I want to just say to kind of give my cred, street cred, is I was the director of research at Lexia Learning, um, and I was there for eight years, and we published, you know, a dozen or more articles, uh, research studies. We actually, if you really count, we told thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of stories to our customers about the data, you know, every month, every year, every day they logged into my Lexia. So um, now I do all my favorite things from Lexia, but I do it for lots of different companies. Um, so I like it. I like working for lots of companies. And right now, most of what I'm doing is testing products that say and are structured literacy. So they say they're based on the science of reading and they're trying to bring more structured literacy to schools. Yeah. And I, it's kind of funny to me because I'm just to introduce myself to anyone who doesn't know. I mean, this is being streamed from my page, so I hope you know who I am by this point. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you never know. Um, I am the co-founder of Pedagogy Non Grata. My name is Nate, and I am the author of a, a couple books on on teaching. Um, most recently, the Scientific Principles of Reading Instruction. And uh, it's it's funny for me because I really I do ha research as a hobby. Yeah, that's all it really is for me. It's just like fun because I'm weird that way and. Um, Rachel does it like professionally for a living. So um, connecting with her has been like a really interesting experience. And we've been collaborating a lot. And I, I think it's funny because like we came at it with a really different lens when we first started. Mm. And I think we both sort of softened our positions to like to take in a little piece of the other person's perspective. And we kind of wrote a paper about that, actually. Um, and I'm hoping it gets published peer reviewed. We submitted it to be peer reviewed, um, which is cool. Um, but tonight, actually, to not to ramble too long, I feel like I'm rambling forever. Not uh, tonight, we're going to talk about Seidenberg's article, which yes. I was really excited about because, um, like, I just thought it was a really fascinating article. Seidenberg is one of those researchers I think that really helped start the science reading movement, and he's one of those people who made phonics cool, um, for lack of a better word. And he wrote one of the first big science of reading books. The I think Kill and Thrill. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, but. He's had some sort of clashes with some uh, big, big people, other scholars in the science reading movement. I think, for lack of a better term, he seems slightly jaded with um, aspects of the movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought I thought it would be interesting to discuss it, the, the context behind it, and give our sort of perspectives. And I think there's really some key truths to some things he's saying. But I think that 
I personally don't completely share his perspective. So um, do you want to say anything before we really start diving into the meat of the, his, his article? Well, I, I have to admit, I've been so focused on product research and who's saying what about what product and really uh, program evaluation mm -hmm. is the field and lens that I bring yeah. to this research. And um, the other role I had recently, I was vice president of learning sciences at HMH, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And while I was there, I really focused on like cognitive science and neuroscience, but really in this more holistic way uh, and a domain agnostic way. So really you and my new clients have taught me about all these writers and theorists in the science of reading movement. I really didn't know. I mean, I never heard of Seidelberg until you were like, hey, Rachel, check out this article. You're so um, keeping, keeping with the news and with the writers and kind of in the weeds with it. So um, I, really, so funny. I really appreciate your perspective because um, I, I often tend to be a little bit more big picture. And I also um, look at the, you know, really look at the products for this very critical um, tech lens as well. Yeah. Um, so my dissertation was using tech technology with education. And then of course, Lexia was all tech. And then while I was at HMH, my, my main role was to help integrate the tech. So um, again, it's just coming from this very different perspective. Yeah, well, I, I sometimes feel out of loop on all the science reading books because there's so many. And um, I don't read a lot of books, actually. I read almost exclusively like studies. So like mm -hmm. sometimes people ask me, like, what do I think about X author? And I'm like, I, I've never read their book. And I feel like this weird person because like I'm writing science reading books and like I'm not really reading everybody else's. But um, it's just because I'm so focused on like the, the experimental research. But oh. that's kind of like going to be a part of this conversation. So why yeah. don't we dive into this article? Where should okay. we Okay. Well, I, I think that we should actually go to the part where he talks about his point. Okay. <laughs> because um, really, I think it kind of comes all together. And okay. his first point is he talks about creating demand. Mm. Creating demand for change yeah yeah great engine now, i was just at ascd this past weekend which is uh, the curriculum director uh, conference and one thing that was really neat is they had oh actually no i'm totally swapping my conferences my bad so what happens when you go to two conferences in a row it was south by southwest so south by southwest edu had a film that emily hanford was a part of called the right to read yeah and there was just an interview with the filmmaker just on the Ed Search podcast just uh, this week. And what it really helped me see and continue to see is this movement for saying, no, it's, it's not okay that two thirds of our young people can't read. And it's a civil rights issue. It's a an it's issue of democracy. And, you know, how can we have democracy and how can we have civil rights if you know, a large portion, most children and a large portion of our population can't read at grade level. Yeah, it's a huge problem. If you can't, I think uh, I've read before, most people can't read a newspaper. How can you make an informed voting decision if you can't read a newspaper? It's a huge problem. I mean, I read, I read the, the packet, the voting packet, and I have a PhD and sometimes I'm confused <laughs> about what they're saying about yes means, about no means. So, I mean, you really do have to have those critical thinking skills and to be able to understand and comprehend what it's saying. Yeah, I think I've, I've got this weird thing where I, I, I've i been actually writing about reading science for five years now. Um, I've been so used to saying four years that it's actually now it seems weird to say five years, but I've been writing and reading and talking about writing, reading science for five years. But for most of that time, I never heard of this term, the science of reading. And oh, it just, it was like this, all of a sudden- Researchers don't use the term, right? No, it, it, they don't. And it, there was this mm. huge explosion of interest and the science of reading and all these social media groups popped up. And I was like, oh, I loved it. I, I, I still do. And I think it's amazing. And you see this huge groundswell of teachers and parents pushing for science-informed reading instruction in schools. And a lot of this is focused around dyslexic students and um, yes. an equity lens and a lot of it's been parents and like it's 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 exciting to see and it I kind of felt like this 
this weirdo howling at the moon uh, alone in the dark uh, <laughs> talking about reading science for like last five years Long time. all of a sudden there's all these people who want to talk about it with me and have conversations and it's uh, really motivated me to, to to work harder when I get to engage with so many uh, people who are so passionate and so focused on the research I think it's incredible so it's from incredible. like my perspective the science of reading movement has been a really good thing I said it was brewing and bubbling it was brewing yes. and bubbling yeah but now it's like <laughs> oh yeah it's, it's just exploded and like yeah I, now I'm starting to hear teachers I work with starting to use some of the terminology and I think it, it's 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 coming everywhere. Like, I feel like everyone's going to hear these terms very soon. Well, I think, I think one of the points that Steinberg makes here though, is that only understanding it a little bit can be a dangerous thing Yeah, because folks might be demanding unreasonable or misplaced requests in the name of the science of reading, but it not actually, it just kind of be, you know, using it as an umbrella term perhaps. Yeah, and I, I think the really dangerous thing about the science reading movement, and this is not to say that this is, is happening, but is there are people in the peripherals of it who are companies who all want to latch on to this term. Mm. And for lack of a better word, there are a lot of influencers who are, are latching on to this term. And I do see some people who are promoting things that aren't really backed by science or the science behind it is theoretical. It's not actually like what we'd call, you know, science, science for like better. So, and I, I we talked about this in a previous talk you and I gave, like the difference between science the noun and science the verb. Like for the most part, when we say science, we actually mean more like a verb. The science is a process. It's a method for finding truth. And when we say science the noun, like this is science, we mean like empirical studies, research has been done and proved this thing to be correct. And I think um, sometimes people make big extrapolations and then they make a product based off it and they start trying to sell that product. And then they have influencers that they're they're supporting. And then we hear this like a whole crowd or movement of people, even inside the science reading movement, say like, oh, this is the, this is the answer. And I think from outsiders, like when I see criticism of the from the balanced literature perspective, when I see the criticism from balanced literacy scholars, they often talk about the science reading movement as if it's one approach, like mm. one thing. And I find that people who are new to the movement too, new teachers will often say like, you'll see them post on social media, what is the science of reading explanation for X? Or what is the science of reading answer for X? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, the science- Like this adjective. A, yeah, I, but it's like, <laughs> it's not a it's not a person. There's not like one science of reading approach. There's there's camps within the science of reading. You know, mm -hmm. there's people who are really interested in um, um, the old school direct instruction style approach. There's some people who are really into a speech to print approach. There's people who are into Orton Gillingham approaches. You have people who are really interested in embedded mnemonics. You have people who really want to use uh, like a morphology informed approach. These are all different, but yeah. under this umbrella. Right. Yeah. And, and I think uh, where I get worried is when people do say things like, well, what is the science of reading answer to X? And then you'll see somebody very authoritatively will answer them in the comments. Oh, it's, it's blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Without like any citation or like thing. And really what they mean is when they, when they say this, they mean, X influencer who I really like told me this answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just said, decided that this is the truth now. And I think that's sort of antithetical to science uh, as how we do science. And I, I really want to make the caveat. I know, I know Rachel really wants to jump and I can see it in her face. Well, I want to transition us because you're, you're segueing us beautifully. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just, I really want to say that's not an attack or <laughs> criticism. It's just, mm. it's more that I do see that and it's a concern. And I think it's one that we have to be careful of. But I think a lot of the people who are really leading the science reading movement are very nuanced, are actual researchers, are really intelligent, brilliant people who who know all of this, all, everything I'm saying, <laughs> and are trustworthy. And yeah. I think it's just, I find it's often people who are very new, and it's influencers sort of on the peripheral that, that, that run this risk. And it's not to say that anyone's acting on a malice. I don't no. think people are acting on a malice at all. But I think we do have to be careful to keep the science in the science of reading. You know, it's a good point. You know, like, um, you know, if we before we were saying it was a bubble that's exploding, but it's also a train. It's a train yeah. that's moving and people are jumping on the train. And you have to also kind of keep in mind, well, what is their agenda? Why are they jumping on the train? Where are they trying to go? Yeah. Um, so everybody has their own reason to be on that train and get a ticket. Right. Um, yeah. So you were talking about kind of like theory 
and you were talking about empirical studies. Um, but then the, the second point in the paper here is the barrier between really bridging research to practice. Mm -hmm. And then there's a theory, there's a pedagogy, but then there's the actual doing of teaching reading, not just mm -hmm. the science of teaching reading, but the doing of teaching reading. And I've, I've come across vendors. So I was at ASCD last weekend. <laughs> and when I went to the vendor, I, I, I was totally honest. I was like, hi, I'm a researcher. And then they were like, what? You're not a teacher? What? Okay. So they get all thrown. But then when I actually talk to them and I say, yeah, I'm curious what kind of research you have at your, on your product. A lot of them just kind of say, yep, we're science of reading based. And that's the end. Like, that's all they needed to say. And I should buy their stuff. And I was like, well, but, but what about your product? Or they say they're Orton Gillingham based and there's tons of research on Orton Gillingham approach. I'm like, yes, but you aren't Orton and Gillingham, right? So I'm, I'm kind of like, but your version, your product, what, what results have you had? What would someone expect if they used your version, your product? And a lot of them, like they were either resistant or they're not really sure what I was talking about, or they just kind of would talk in circles. Um, but I think that even when you talk to teachers, a lot of them also say they go to Orton Gillingham, they go to the national reading panel and they call that the evidence for why they bought the product that they bought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think you're really, you're, you're really touching on the difference between research-based and evidence-based. And I see a ton of confusion on this issue. Do you want to explain that to people? Cause I don't know that anyone will know that better than you actually. As sure. A researcher. Sure. So so helpful. I happen to have a blog post on this topic. Um, and what I've done is I've created two little booklets. And in fact, someone very thoughtfully called it research for dummies or Essa for, Essa for dummies. I think she called it because it's yellow, has a yellow cover. Um, but um, so really what the, the biggest difference that when I think about it is research-based is about what should be taught and how it should be taught. No child maybe could have ever used the program ever, and it could still be research-based with zero, zero students ever using it. Now, evidence-based is showing how does this product work? What results should we expect if we use this product? And what results did some real kids and real teachers get when real kids and real teachers use this product. And ideally that evidence is going to be strong evidence, which means there was some sort of experimental or quasi experimental design when we're comparing students who use the product to students who are similar, but did not use the product. Yeah. And I, I think this really, it does apply to pedagogies too. And that's been a big lens for me. And so I'll, I'll give an example. So for a pedagogy to be research-based, we just really have to have any studies that provide a theoretical basis for it. So we can have linguistic studies that like look at elements of language and the frequency of certain elements of language. For example, we could have studies that show like the English language is morphophonemic, which it is by the way, which means that uh, it's primarily driven by morphology and etymology, but it's driven on secondarily by phonology. But that doesn't necessarily mean that in practice, morphology is better than phonics. Just because the language is more morpho morphologically based doesn't actually mean that using a more morphologically dominant approach will get you better results. And the only way to know that is by doing studies where we have like one group of students gets more phonics and one group of students gets more morphology and we compare. Like that, there's technically, there's a second way we can measure that, but I won't get into that tonight. But we need research, like actual studies. And this goes back to like what science is. Like science is supposed to be a method for testing ideas and hypotheses to find truth. So. Um, there's, you know, other forms of theoretical science, like that can inform understanding, like, um, neuroscience or brain imaging studies where we like, um, hook people up to an MRI machine and we see what part of their brains are being activated at different times. And they do different activities to make inferrals of like how people learn how to read. And that's really important stuff because it, it helps to form our theories of reading and it helps to give us ideas to test. But like, we cannot make the extrapolation that, um, a student was hooked up to a neural imaging machine and had a part of their brain activated, therefore all instruction needs to match what happened in that neuroimaging machine, because that's mm. too far removed from practice. And Dr. Shanahan has talked about that a lot. 
And we need to have studies that say, show, test the idea of how to apply this in practice in a classroom and see which groups of students learn more. And, and that's how we do the difference between evidence-based and pedagogy versus research-based in um, just like teaching methods, not just products. And I did want to touch on the importance of looking at like research-based for products too. Um, I've been reviewing, every, I think most people who follow this blog now, I've been reviewing a lot of like phonics programs and I, I've put out a couple meta-analyses on these topic. And I showed that on average, structured literacy programs show a mean effect size of roughly 0.45, depending on the, the date of the study and which studies I have included, because I keep updating it over and over again, like a crazy person. But um, it, it's, we appreciate it's, fluctu you. It's, it's fluctuated between like 0.42 to 0.48, but the average has always stayed roughly around 0.45. Mm. And, um, but if you op open the hood of that meta-analysis and look more carefully, you would see that some of the programs show really high results, and some of those programs show really low results. And actually, I have a really hard time explaining why. And if you look at the, the just the average outcome, it shows that like, hey, um, phonics on average has like a pretty strong effect, but not a crazy high effect, like a, just a, a decent input impact on student learning. Um, and I, I think that sort of ignores uh, this weird elephant in the room for research that um, there's a, a giant variability here. And it, like the quality of the program you're using actually matters. And I there's a piece of me that actually thinks that sucks. And, and the reason I think that sucks as a teacher is I don't like buy, paying for things. I don't like buying stuff. That's why there's a huge, I try to promote free stuff all the time on my website. Oh, that's nice. Because I don't like buying things. I've actually never bought a program. So I, when I started doing these reviews, I was really hoping to find that all phonics programs showed like roughly the same and it didn't matter. So just get any free program or get a little bit of phonics training and you'll mm. be golden. And mm -hmm. I, the research I did really showed the opposite, that oh. actually having a quality program mattered. And that kind mm. of annoys me. Like I would really rather have the opposite. Um, uh, and But part of that too, I think, is there's so many different types of programs. And then even if we have like the same type of program, there's other variables too, like uh, how much phonics do they get a day? How fast is the scope and sequence? What is the scope and sequence? Um, and what does tier two and tier three intervention look like? What does intervention look like What versus the core? Yeah, to totally. Like we have so many That's different huge. approaches out here. Um, so it's, it's, I think sometimes it is important to say like, well, what is evidence-based versus what's research-based? Yeah. And I, I got another one to kind of throw that I have, a, I have another example of um, where the research is really relevant to the product, like how close the research is in terms of relevance. So here's an example for you. Handwriting, teaching children letter formation. There's some research that shows if you teach the children the letters in clusters by, by the letters that have similar strokes, they can learn more letters faster than if you teach that to them maybe in alphabetical order. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So that's very directly related to this product, right? That teaches the children the letters and clusters and does it, you know, over six weeks, one cluster at a time, instead of 26 letters, one week at a time. I mean, you can see right away how that would be so much faster and how tightly connected the research is to the product. Totally. I, I can give another example of this. I'm uh, a little reveal here. I'm releasing the, the Monday blog or the Tuesday. I think it's going to come out Tuesday, actually. The Tuesday blog for this week is going to be on EBLI and speech to print. And I've, I've reviewed all of the speech to print programs and that's going to be coming cool. out on, on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, Very neat. So like reviewing a speech review, comparing EBLI research and reading simplified research is very applicable in my mind because they're very similar programs, kind of similar to who, uh, comparing Letterland and Jolly Phonics, but like taking um, corrective reading and empower and reading simplified and evil eye and putting them together under one effect size, it's um, a little bit less accurate of a measurement because those are all very different things. So I another can look- story for you. <laughs> oh yeah, go for it. Oh yeah, so another story for you. So here's the example where the research is very far away from the intervention. So nutrition. So we know that eating healthier foods, eating lower calorie foods, maybe eating fewer total calories, there's all research, there's research behind those kinds of nutrition and weight management solutions. Would you agree? Definitely, definitely. Definitely. Okay. So have you ever gone into a fast food restaurant and seen that there's calories on the menu? Definitely. 
Okay, so I don't know about you, but when I'm going to McDonald's, right, I'm getting a McFlurry, I'm getting French fries, I'm getting a hamburger. Like, I don't care how many calories there are. What do you like to get? Well, I'm a weirdo who's really into like personal fitness. So like, <laughs> I actually count my calories on my phone. Like I record everything I eat in a day and how many calories I ate. So, okay, like, so I you are really, an outlier. Yeah, I pay really careful <laughs> attention to that because I'm entering into my phone as I eat it. Okay, so you are not most, maybe most people. So, and I have two, I have over 200 studies that show that. Okay, but anyway, so. In America, in the United States, there, um, as part of the Affordable Care Act, um, there was a law that fast food restaurants had to explain how many, had to put how many calories were in each of the items. You know, with the research base, right, that eating fewer calories would help maybe curb the obesity crisis. I mean, I don't know how, how far they were going with this goal, but the law passed. So I myself was like, you know, in, because we're doing this work, you know, talking about research and everything, I was like, I wonder how many studies were done to inform this law that, you know, affected millions of menus across America. And I was only able to find one, one from 2009 before the, before it went to law. And that study was done in a lab at a university with college students that showed, yes, on average, students ordered less food or less caloric food when they knew the, the menu, uh, the calories on the menu. Um, so I was curious, well, how many sites have been done since? And does it work? Because, you know, I kind of know that knowing how many calories are in something is very different than the behavior of keeping track of calories like you, right? You have a behavior that's in, in inside you. It's a drive. You have this passion for it. That's not most, you know, that's not necessarily what people are thinking about when they're going to McDonald's, right? So over 200 studies have been done on the actual menus and the actual with the calories. And they're shown there's really been no difference in people and what people order. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, fact, I will like definitely look at a calorie. Like that was really scary for me. Like, I remember like one of the first times I looked at a McDonald's milkshake, like the large milkshake, I used to get like an extra large milkshake, a burger. And I saw the calories and sugars and I was like, oh, what have so I you, done? It, it changed your behavior or it oh, just made you feel bad. Did it just make you feel bad or? Uh, no, I changed my behavior and I felt. <laughs> uh, I want to give a quick shout out, by the way. I just figured out how Facebook works and I can, I realized that there's a whole bunch of people like commenting us. If you want to get out some shout outs. So like some of the people like, I see you're watching us, we're recognized too. Okay. Uh, shout out to Sarah and Jennifer and Bonnie and um, Janice um, and Christy. It's so nice to have you guys join our, our, our live video. And uh, thank you. Um, to be giving up your Thursday night on long weekend to, to do that. That's yes. really cool. And whatever you do, don't go to McDonald's because no longer even have salads. Oh, the, the salads have more calories than the burgers though. I don't know. If you That's why that. they stopped selling them because oh, everyone really. finally knew. <laughs> so um, I, I wanted to talk, talk about uh, the phonemic awareness. Wait, debate. I didn't get to tell you the punchline. Oh, I apologize. I'm so sorry. I got distracted. <laughs> you have to let me tell the punchline. Okay. Okay. My so, sorry. so I went back to the study in 2009, yeah. okay? And I looked at the sample and I really looked at the subgroup analysis. And this is what you have to do if you really want to find out if a program works or not. For sure. I actually saw that the boys in the study didn't change their behavior at all. It was only the girls. And it was the girls, the, the girls teenage and girls, the teenage girls who in a lab were told how many calories they were about to consume and, and said, yeah, I'll have less. Yeah. That was, that turned into the law world and a, and a countrywide phenomenon that doesn't 330 work. million people later. Uh, right. And I think that's yeah. such a perfect example, how one study in one place in one with one population doesn't mean that that's evidence-based either. Yeah. And you know what, that's such a, a good point for, for general in looking at the science of reading too, because I think a big part of the science reading movement has been focused on phonics and rightfully so it was sort of excluded from a lot of education and um, but I do sometimes see people being like, uh, yes, phonics should be taught like every single grade. And I'm like, no, uh, the research really doesn't support that. Like the research, yeah. like, I think I, you'd be really hard pressed to find a, like a serious scientific researcher on education to say like, you should teach phonics in older grades. Now I can think of examples like, like for older struggling students who miss that, that instruction. Yes, they do need that's filling that in gaps. Right. To cover the gaps. Exactly. Mm. But like, should it be standard practice? Like every grade eight classroom gets phonics? No. And I've even seen a, a couple people say like, we should be teaching phonics in high school. And I'm like, 
they're really like you can't say like science of reading movement it says um we should be teaching phonics in high school yeah. and like i said the researchers know that like if you if you yeah. talk to like holly lane who's like one of the really big researchers who's been behind the science reading push or matt burns like they're not going to come out and tell you to teach phonics in every grade they're they're quite clear on that um but you definitely see we'll see like the occasional teacher saying that. and every once in a while i'll like post on social media about this like you shouldn't be teaching phonics like across the board every grade and I'm, there's always like a big surprise like i always get like a whole bunch of like surprise emojis and like people messaging me like are you sure and, like the the big i think study that really started a lot of this was the nrp phonics Men analysis in 2000 and they were like really explicit that the research did not support older students learning phonics uh my own research has been a little bit more positive for older students but that was only for struggling readers because i have actually not found any studies on older readers for core instruction for phonics mm -hmm. i i i'm going to talk about this a little bit in speech to my speech print art article coming out i do think mm -hmm. speech to print phonics works a bit better for older students than does like traditional phonics so i could see that being beneficial because it's really easy to apply to larger words and to to break down some of those multisyllabic words um but that's like but that's like i think this comes back to that like advanced phonics yeah and you have to look at the context and i got a quote when we said we were doing this live chat today i somebody mm -hmm. sent me a qu comment asking if we could talk about john hattie's work oh yeah let's get some questions in because like we pretty much covered the article okay well like john speaking of like john hattie's work and like how yeah. his, like i love john hattie i'm a huge fan i think he revolutionized the education industry but his methodology isn't without limitations and problems and i think his biggest limitation and problem is uh he doesn't address context very well and he doesn't doesn't address study quality very well either so yeah. um like you can look at john hattie's work and you can see like a mean effect size of like 0.57 for phonics as he that's his effect size um but that's you cannot apply that across the board without looking at the context behind that some of those studies yeah. um um studies on st uh, students in nordic europe where the um students have a much more phonetically or phonetically regular language and some yes. of those and most of those studies are on younger students so you definitely can't take that 0.57 effect size which is large and be like all right we're teaching phonics at all times everywhere your um, context your point about context i actually think fits in really well with the third point from the article Simon Burns. yes yes and that is that it's kind of like every study might have its own con like has its own context so when I talk about research and we talk about program evaluation, really what we're looking at is a set of context and conditions and what happened. And that's one of the reasons why product research has to be replicated. And we have a repli replication crisis in, in the scientific community in general, but yeah. we cannot allow the lack of repli replication to happen in education. Yeah. We can't. And I, I I think there's some some who would argue that we don't need replication in, in education science. Like if the studies are of high enough quality, that we don't need replication. And I not true. I could not disagree more with that. I me put too. an article me, about that a couple of weeks ago. Actually, too. you helped me on it. You helped me on that, Eric. We did it together. My pleasure. And we, and we thank you. And we look <laughs> we looked at some of this that like RTI or some of the RCTs on like really specific topics like it was like the exact same topic same like demographic same study design and they still show widely different results if you looked across all those studies like there was one where it was the exact same study basically same program same design same like age and one showed an effect size of like 0.5 and one showed an effect size of zero yeah. and I don't even think taking an average of those two studies makes sense because that just shows you that one of those studies is wrong like yeah. so they can't I'm both be right I'm going to open the door. Design. I'm going to open the door a little bit and you're going to I'm going to let you peek into ed tech for a second. Okay. So when I was at Lexia, not only could I do the same study, did I do the same study over and over again with different schools that were like efficacy studies where I collected data that wasn't the Lexia data, but we actually had Lexia assessment quality data with millions of children every single month that I got to look at every day. So in a way, I did thousands, tens of thousands of studies like every year with the Lexia data in all these contexts and conditions and demographic profiles and reading profiles. And, and they were all the results were always the same, right? Well, well, 
I have to tell you, sometimes it was a little uncanny. I would see the same numbers over and over again. I felt like I was like in Groundhog's Day sometimes because there were a lot of incredible consistencies, um, which was really, really neat. And then, of course, the other thing we did is um, so Wichita, Kansas, it was our and I think pretty sure this is public information. <laughs> Uh, Wichita, Kansas, we used with them at one point, we used them for our norm sample. And I was able to perfectly match the sample with the US demographics at the time from the census. That's awesome. I mean, so, you know, when you be when you're really intentional, you know, when product designers and research and internal, you know, product researchers are really intentional, they can do some pretty incredibly relevant work. But unfortunately not everyone is intentional yeah okay oh i i want to go back for a second here if you don't mind I, we're jumping a little bit all over the place but i really want to talk about the the parts about phonemic awareness and kilpatrick and Hegarty yes. in the article that came up because i think that was a real hot button issue and um it's been an, uh, like sort of a pet issue of seidenberg's for a while and i think it's part of why he's feeling a little bit bitter with the science reading movement i think there's been within not everyone. I think, like, for example, Holly Lane is a really big research from the science reading movement. She's been very clear. The research doesn't support, like, oral-only phonemic awareness in comparison to phonemic awareness with letters. And that was a finding of the International Reading Panel of Analysis. They showed that phonemic awareness that included letters got double the results that phonemic awareness that did not include letters. Um, but there are a lot of, like, Dr. Kilpatrick, um, he really pushes phonemic awareness without letters. And he pushes this idea that it should be taught for a really long time. And he also pushes the idea that it should be focused on deletion and manipulation, which are two types of drills that the research has shown work less well than segmenting and blending. Um, and a lot of research has been very critical of Dr. Kilpatrick for this reason, including Nathan Cullen, um, Shanahan, Erie, um, Stephen Parker, um, and Seidenberg. And those are all giant names, I think, in the science of reading movement. Yeah. been very critical of this i mean also um, like if you think about um the tests the assessments yeah that measure um these early literacy skills it's 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 phoneme segmentation fluency not yeah. phoneme deletion fluency yeah and the scientific research like we now have more data than the nrp like the nrp showed that this these trends are like that segmenting and blending was the most important and mm -hmm. that um phonemic awareness with letters was better than phonemic awareness without um, but we have more studies since then that have come out and shown the exact same thing. Like we, there the was just a thing. huge meta-analysis that came out last year that was was better done, for lack of a better term, because it's more new, it's more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And it showed the exact same results. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but there are still, there's still a group of people who really want to push that oral only phonemic awareness, like phonemic awareness for a long time and mm -hmm. um, without letters. And I, I like, I, I get the criticism there. Like I understand um, but that's a problem. Uh, but I, I also think that, you know, it's okay for people to be wrong or for us to disagree with each other. Like Dr. Kilpatrick has still been a giant in this field who has contributed in amazing ways. Mm. He's one of the, like Seidenberg and Kilpatrick are two scholars who have made phonics cool. They made the science of reading cool. Like of all these people here are here because in part, Louisa Moltz and Seidenberg and Kilpatrick. And so there, I feel like there's sort of the the OG, original gangster uh, author <laughs> of the science of reading, um, who made this all happen. And um, you can't ignore any of their contributions. And that doesn't mean that we have to accept every hypothesis they have without criticism. And there are mm -hmm. definitely fans of Kilpatrick who will swear up and down that the science is wrong and Kilpatrick is right. And like, I, I have friends from the science reading community who will have send me those messages be like, hey, I understand that the research doesn't support this but I still think Kilpatrick's right because of my own experience in my own classroom. And I actually think that's an incredibly mature position to be able to say like, I've read the research, I understand it. And then in my own classroom experience, I disagree, here's why. And I have things I disagree with. Like I, the research doesn't really support peer tutoring within the same grade. And I love peer tutoring in my classes. And I believe that I, it's one of my most effective tools. And I, I think it's the way I implement it and it's how, how I do it that makes it effective. But there's really no research suggesting that I'm right on that. In fact, mm. the research suggests I'm firmly wrong that you, I should not encourage peer tutoring in my classroom. Mm. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, I, I just, I, I think, I do think Seidenberg is a little too harsh on on Kilpatrick, and I think a lot mm. of 
scholars have gotten really upset at Kilpatrick recently on this theory and they've like really come down on him. And I, in my book, I, I state that I think he's wrong, but at the same time, I still think he's right on a lot of things. Like he was right that phonics is important. He's right that phonemic awareness is important. And he really points to this idea that um, dyslexia is like an auditory processing problem. And I don't know, I don't know if all dyslexic cases are caused by that, but I think certainly a large number are. Yes. Yeah, and there is also research showing that dyslexic students specifically benefit from phonemic awareness instruction more than non-dyslexic students and um, for longer periods of time. And I think that's important to note too, because that was a claim of Kilpatrick's also that dyslexic students benefit from phonemic awareness for longer than do non-dyslexic students. Well, then and there's we also have research to support that. the definition of longer. Is longer, does longer really mean more repetitions or does longer mean more days? I would say both in this context, like, mm -hmm. like Kilpatrick really supports like a lot of repetitions. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I also think like people are changing their minds on this issue. Like I've seen most, most researchers seem to agree with Seinberger on the, Seinberg on this, not Burger, I don't know, I called him Burger. Um, and, uh, <laughs> it's your nickname now. <laughs> yeah. And uh even Haggerty, like, which is a, which started off as a normal only phenemic awareness, has like made statements recently saying that like they recognize the research on this and they've been making changes to their program to try and better align with science reading, which actually okay. like, that's what science should do. Like, yeah, this, this is one place where I might disagree with some people in the science reading movement. Like if Faunus and Pinal and reading recovery and um, units of study want to come out tomorrow and like completely revamp their program to be like fully based on the science reading. I would happily endorse those changes and and give them big attaboy pat on the back, whatever you want to call it. I would give them kudos. I, and I think some people are angry at those those companies and those scholars. Um, but I think what really matters at the end of the day is kids learning how to read. And science is supposed to be about change. Like it's a process. It you know, you test process. something, you learn, okay, this doesn't and work. This works better. Let's change. What's so important to remember about research too, we talked about context and conditions, but there's also kind of like time. Mm. Time is its own element of those two things where the children of today aren't the children of four years ago, you know, and they're not the children of 10 years ago. So that's why we have to keep doing research. That's why we have to um, do replication of even the same product, right? Um, over time in different times um, and why you'll always have um, research to fuel your, pa your passion. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> well, <laughs> more variables keep coming out for you. Yeah, actually, I think time as a variable in research is one of the more ignored ones in the sense that like sometimes results really change if you look at different durations of studies. And Duration like, too. Mm -hmm. we, yeah, we need to know like, like when, how long is this intervention effective for? Like quality and quantity yeah and you, you have to look at all those contexts of demographics and times and frequency yeah. um so you know what were what was your biggest takeaway from the article and and what advice would you give teachers based off this well i really appreciated the nuance between mm -hmm. being research-based and um, evidence-based. And, you know, he says it right, right here, let's say a company's goal is to create curricula and software that is evidence-based and consistent with the science of reading. You know, I got, I have to tell you, most, most companies still are not meeting, not most, I don't know if it's most, but a lot of companies are still not meeting that criteria. Oh yeah. They really are not. Sense. And if you want to get a good list that's public, um, I recommend checking out the state of Arizona. The Department of Arizona, U.S. Department of Education in Arizona put together a list and they asked every single vendor to give evidence that their product was effective with not just some kids, but like a good chunk. Like I remember I at first gave them some research that had like 20 something kids that they're like, nope, not good enough, <laughs> need more. Um, but since then, I've actually gotten one, two, three, four, five, four, five, four products approved, six if you include my old Lexia products um, in the state of Arizona now. So um, I, 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 maybe we can put that in the, in the Facebook chat um, yeah. because there aren't, uh, there aren't that many good lists. And, and just for, just to see the complete opposite situation, 
um, Massachusetts put together a list and it does have like 25 something products on it, but in the evidence section, it's blank. Yeah. It literally has no evidence that any of the products on its list are effective. And I guess that was okay with the people who made that list. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there was a, I got a bunch of people sent me questions about a state that just passed a, a law on this like a couple of weeks ago, and they came out with a list of pro approved programs, oh. and there was only three programs on the list, and none of them That's had an lot. experimental study, <laughs> and I, I, I like, like, I don't hate any of the three programs, like, I'm not against any of them, but at the same time, I was like, I don't oh, understand how about. these are the three approved, they like, they're, <laughs> by definition, you? they're not evidence-based, I was like, kind of like, this seems like a really random and arbitrary list to me was I thought what I thought. <laughs> um, I, you oh, know, goodness. yeah. What was your main takeaway? Well, for me, my main takeaway was this is something I'd actually been like wrestling with myself a little while. Like I was really happy that he wrote his article. I, I agree with you. It was really nuanced. And well, I felt like he was too harsh, to be honest, both about the term science reading. Like he kind of implies that he thinks that the term is no longer good. I don't agree. I think the science reading movement has been largely positive. I agree. Sort of, he sort I of argues agree. against that. I'm I'm definitely in favor. Of get the on the train. Yeah. Get, I'm, 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 yeah, definitely get on the train. <laughs> like, I, I do think we do have to be really careful to not uh, let the science go out of the science reading and let it become like a dogma. And that, he does talk about that, like avoiding becoming a dogma. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I on my website, I have a list of blogs that I, I endorse. Um, and there are other blogs that I'm really tempted to do endorse, but something that I really want to see as an ingredient for when I recommend someone else is like writing is I really want to see that when they make a claim that something is science, I want them to one, have a reference and mm. two, I want them to unpack that reference. So for example, people will sometimes have like a bibliography of like studies that support their opinion, but they haven't unpacked those studies. They haven't said what kind of studies they are, what the results were, what the context of the studies were. And I don't think that's good enough. And, and maybe that sounds harsh because like from like a teacher perspective, most teachers don't know how to read research. So like they might feel like, well, this is directed to tor towards teachers. But I think if we want to keep the science in it, like we have to be able to show how this is science and why this is science. It's not good enough to be like, this is the science of reading X. You know, um, I see that all the time. And they're like more so in common sections than like um, the scholars who, you know, are really behind this. But you definitely mm -hmm. see teachers point out like, you know, for example, I've seen tons of people say the science of reading is we shouldn't teach high frequency words. We should teach heart, heart words. And like heart words, like I think there's two studies on it. I haven't read those two studies. I, I heard, I've heard they showed good results, um, but it, like, it's still like a, a new approach. And like, there's no real research showing that like teaching kids to uh, a sight word is, is harmful. So like that's that's a big jump. And Dr. Shanahan has put out some some blog posts about that. And I, I put out one too, but hmm. and it's not, I think it context matters in practice too. Like, like when I teach sight words, I teach them through segmenting. Like we put the word up on the board, we segment it, we break down the so sounds in it, um, and we teach from that phonologically. Um, but like, do can I point to any like hard research to show you should never memorize a word and that you should all learn all words through heart word instruction no and that's not to pick on heart words either it's just to pick on the claim that like heart words is specifically what the science of reading approach is because one there is no science reading approach the science of reading is a body of research um it's not an approach and uh two we don't have the level of research to show that like that is the sole best answer you know like reading simplified by marty ginsburg is another program that has a completely different way of teaching sight words and it's a, it's, I think it's one of the most evidence-based programs and Jolly Phonics, again, another approach for teaching reading, also very evidence-based has lots of studies that show high results Has a completely different approach from heart words has a completely different approach from reading simplified still shows high results. Um, yeah. and you know, Dr. Shanahan points out there's about 200 words in the English language that make about 50% of all print. So like, uh, teaching students to memorize some of like the most phonetically irregular words, like one, for example. I've seen, I saw someone posting about that on, on social media the other day, like how difficult it is to segment one. And it is a really tricky word. So like teaching kids to memorize the word one, I don't know if that's a bad thing. Now, in practice, I think that part of this comes to like Fonts Pinnell, for, not to pick on Fonts Pinnell, 
had kids like being sent home pages and pages of sight words to memorize. And that kind of like dips into whole language where it's like, instead of like teaching kids how to code, we're going to have you memorize the English language, which we too know. Too many that. words. <laughs> yeah. Like there's, two mil- like there's two million words in English language. You cannot memorize the English language, but that doesn't mean that we can, should never memorize a word. And maybe we shouldn't. Like, I just don't think that there's the research out there yet personally to say you should never teach a kid to memorize a word. Cause that's a very, whenever we say never or always, I get worried because that's a really strong claim. And if you're going to make a really strong claim, Wait, I think you need that, really you strong research. You can never make any of those claims. I don't <laughs> know how many, I don't know how many of those claims you can make, but I, I do want, you, you mentioned actually knowing what the research study says. Yeah. And I did want to let our audience know about a resource in an organization who also cares about that, Nate. That is Digital Promise. Okay. The Digital Promise is an organization, a nonprofit that helps educators understand research and helps vendors use research to make better products. So it's actually created by an act of Congress in the United States. And it was kind of like, oh my gosh, technology is coming for us. We better put someone in charge of the educators or the education world and technology. And that's why it's called the promise of, di- the promise of digital, like in education, digital promise. So I've actually helped a couple of folks receive or apply for their certifications for their research. It's called a research-based product certification. And you have to literally list every study, not every, but like up to, you know, five to 10 studies that you use that are like, that are, you know, very relevant to your product and list exactly who was in the study, what the study found, what decision, design decision you made because of that study that you read and then like what happened and with a screenshot, like you have to show the proof. Um, so, I mean, I've helped a couple companies get these and, you know, it's a lot of work. You have to really think through, you have to go back to your notes, go back to your bookshelf and be like, oh yeah, th- we were, we had this question and we looked at this study and this is what we saw. So, I mean, even just going through that exercise, I'd recommend any, any people making pr- curriculum out there even if it's just the curriculum in your own classroom, thinking about the, pro- the you know, the studies that were done, you know, pick, pick an area or a time period of your classroom lesson, be like, oh my goodness, like what studies is there, are informing what I'm doing right here? Yeah, totally. And I guess like, for me, that would be my, my, my really one big takeaway, like just, and as a rule, like if someone's going to tell you something is science and they don't have a citation, that's a huge red flag. Like, and it's one thing in like a, a comment on a Facebook post, but it's another, like if they've written an article and there's like no citation. And then if they do have citations, have they explained them? Have they gone through and said like, what does the study show? What type of study is it? Because there's a really big difference between a case study and an RCT or a meta-analysis. And like, if they are going to use an RCT, like, are they going to use one or are they going to use multiple? And like, yeah. Like personally, I'd prefer to see like, okay, we've unpacked several studies. These are what they show. And that's why on my blog, I like, I have a whole page where I like, I promote other people's blogs and, and articles. And it's just, do they fit that criteria? Are, are they um, citing studies and are they unpacking the studies? Um, and there's, there's blogs I really like and that I wanted to put on there. And I've just, I've sort of held off because they, they weren't doing that. Um, and it's, I think those people are still like, what they're saying is accurate. But my, my concern is like, how do you as the reader who's not already familiar with that research know what they're saying is accurate if they're not? Right. And I think that's how we keep the science and science reading. But that's just my opinion. Oh, and that's another thing I help people do with the Digital Promise application is we always write a blog post with citations and we explain the studies. And I think that's another way that, um, you know, it, there's a, some, you know, there's some substance behind it. Yeah. Um, well, I appreciate the reminder for citations and the reminder to go, go to the study. I, I hope I haven't been like on my soapbox tonight. I, well, and if you need to find a study, you can go to like Google scholar.google.com, right? Scholar.google. I, I don't have memories. I always go to Google and then type into Google, Google Scholar. And then get the <laughs> okay. I'm saving you a few clicks, friends. Um, <laughs> and then. And if you, if you really need help finding, actually, Nate and I wrote an article, how to find a research, how to find a study. Um, so we have, yeah. have we have more, um, more Forgot. great, great pieces for you and we should wrap up. We're at, yeah. we're not, we're at an hour. 
Yeah, I, I do apologize to the audience because we've really spent a lot of time on research methodology, which is actually my favorite topic, weirdly. Um, so I apologize if I've nerded out and got on my soapbox because that's that's what will get me on a soapbox faster than anything else is talking about research methodology. Um, but thank you for, to those of you who watched live and took time out of your your long week and thank um, you Thursday evening. And uh, to everyone else, enjoy your evening and hope you like the video. Yeah, and uh, catch us next time. We don't have a topic for next time. Maybe, maybe, maybe next time we have to say what our next topic will be so people come back. <laughs> okay, have a good night. Yeah.